This hearing will come to order. Without objection, all members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel, which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses in the record. I will go and, and uh, start with my opening statement and uh, proceed to anybody else who's anxious to do the same. For far too long, the United States government has been less than transparent in releasing information relating to its gold holdings. Not surprisingly, this secrecy has been given, has given rise to a number of theories about the gold at Fort Knox and other depositories. Some people speculate that the gold has been involved in gold swaps with foreign governments or bullion banks. Others believe that the gold has secretly been shipped out of Fort Knox and sold. And still others believe that the bars at Fort Knox are actually gold-plated tungsten. Historically, the Treasury and the Mint have dismissed these theories rather than addressing these concerns with substantive rebuttals. No one from Congress has been allowed to view the gold at Fort Knox in nearly 40 years. Recent photographs of gold holdings seem to be hard to come by, and the Mint and the Inspector General's audit statements contain only the bare minimum of information. Because the government has for so long refused to provide substantive information on its gold holdings, it is not surprising that so much confusion abounds, both within and without the government. The difference between custody and ownership, questions about the responsibility for, gold, for U.S. gold hold held at the New York Fed, and the issue of which division at Treasury is ultimately responsible for the gold reserves are just some of the questions that have come up during the research for this hearing. In a way, it seems as though someone decided to lock up the gold, put the key in a desk somewhere, and walk off without telling anyone anything. Only during the preparation for this hearing was my office informed that the Mint has, in fact, conducted assays of statistically representative samples of gold bars, and we were provided with a sample assay report. This type of information should be reported, or at least tabulated and published so that the public knows exactly how many bars of gold exist, what their fineness is, and whether they are encumbered in any way through loans or swaps. While various agencies concerned have been very accommodating to my staff in attempting to shed some light on this issue, it should not require the introduction of legislation or a congressional hearing to gain access to this information. This information should be published and available to the American people. This gold belongs to the people, especially since much of it was forcibly taken from them in the 1930s, and the government owes it to the people to provide them with the details of these holdings. We would greatly benefit from a full, accurate inventory audit and assay with detailed explanations of who owns the gold and who is responsible for ownership, custody, and auditing. While the Mint and the Inspector General trust the accuracy of the audits performed between 1975 and 1986, this still means that at least two-thirds of the gold reserves were last audited over a quarter century ago. Surely a full audit every 25 years is not too much to ask. I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses regarding the conditions of the gold reserves, the accounting audits that are regularly performed, and the inventories and assays that have been conducted on some of this gold over the years. I'm also very interested to hear the comments on the Gold Reserve Transparency Act so that we may put forward a measure that provides the public with accurate and complete information on their gold. I yield back my remaining time of my five minutes and yield uh, to uh, Mr. Clay for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this hearing entitled Investigating the Gold, H.R. 1495. The Gold Reserve Transparency Act of 2011 and the oversight of the United States Gold Holdings. Uh, I, too, look forward to the witness's testimony, uh, and, and I also noted that uh, uh, in the Treasury's Inspector General's written testimony that uh, he wrote that the IG is required by law to perform an annual audit of the Mint 
public enterprise funds, financial statements, and those statements include the balances of custodial deep storage gold reserves held by the Mint. Uh, it, it seems as though there, there is already an annual audit uh, that, that both the IG and the GAO believe is already required of them. Uh, however, Mr. Chairman, one other suggestion is perhaps we, we as a subcommittee may consider uh, uh, taking a tour of Fort Knox and the other place or places that house the gold and, become, and really witness for ourselves uh, if, it, if it's going, I don't know if that would be enough to determine if the, if the gold is uh, authentic. Uh, but, but, I mean, it may be something for the committee to consider. So I look forward to the witness's testimony. And again, I thank the chairman. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman for his suggestion. I think it is a good idea to go and at least uh, show our interest. But uh, I personally would feel like I would have shortcomings on looking at a bar and knowing exactly what I was looking at. But there's no reason why we can't, you know, at least consider that as a starting point. Um, does any other member care for an opening statement? Okay, I will uh, proceed into the, uh, into the questions. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, in introduce our uh, two witnesses. Uh, Mr. Gary Angle is the Director of Financial Management and Assurance at the Government Accounting Office. He directs GAO's annual audit of U.S. government's consolidated financial statements as well as audits of key financial statements at the Department of Treasury. And I want to uh, uh, welcome Mr. Angle as well as the Honorable Eric M. Thorson, has been the Inspector General of the Department of the Treasury since 2008 as Treasury IG. He manages oversight of the Treasury through independent audits, investigations, and, and review. And we will go ahead and uh, uh, proceed with the testimony of uh, Mr. Thorson. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon. My testimony will cover the audits done by my office on the United States Mint's schedule of custodial deep storage gold reserves. Hereafter, I'll mostly refer to them simply as the gold reserves. Before I discuss the details of the audits that are the topic of this hearing, I want to make one point very clear. 100% of the U.S. government's gold reserves in the custody of the Mint has been inventoried and audited. Furthermore, these audits found no exceptions of any consequence. I also want to assure you that the physical security over the gold reserves is absolute. I can say that without any hesitation because I have observed the gold and the security of the gold reserves myself. Accordingly, the requirements of H.R. 1495, which calls for a full assay, inventory, and audit of gold reserves of the United States, together with an analysis of the sufficiency of the measures taken for the security of such reserves is redundant of audit work already done. Since 1993, my office has performed annual audits of the government's deep storage gold reserves held by the Mint. In fact, our fiscal year 2011 audit of the gold reserves is currently underway. My testimony today will briefly describe what the Mint gold reserves include and the annual audits performed by my office since 1993. The Mint ma maintains its storage gold reserves in three highly secure locations, Fort Knox, Kentucky, West Point, New York, and Denver, Colorado. While it would be inappropriate for me to discuss the details of the security arrangements in place at these facilities, I can tell you that they are multi-layered and include substantial physical barriers, armed guards, cameras, and metal detectors. In all, 42 compartments at these three hardened facilities hold 699,515 gold bars with a fineness or purity ranging from 0.47 to 0.9999 with an average fineness of 0 0.9006. As of September 30, 2010, the audited quantity of the gold reserves held by the Mint was over 245 million fine troy ounces weighing over 9,300 tons with a market value of $320,600,000,000. 
I might add that each gold bar weighs about 27 pounds and has an average value of about half a million dollars. In June 1975, the Treasury Secretary authorized and directed a continuing audit of U.S. government-owned gold for which Treasury is accountable. Pursuant to that order, the Committee for Continuing Audit of the U.S. Government-Owned Gold performed annual audits of Treasury's gold reserves from 1975 to 1986, placing all inventoried gold that it observed and tested under an official joint seal. The committee was made up of staff from Treasury, the Mint, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The annual audits by the committee ended in 1986 after 97% of the government-owned gold held by the Mint had been audited and placed under official joint seal. It should be noted that during the entire period of these audits and up to today, no discrepancies of any consequence have ever been found. This is an example of the seal, and I've put pictures of these in my testimony. This is an actual seal that came off one of the uh, compartments. My office began conducting annual audits of the gold reserves in fiscal year 1993. Since 2005, these audits have supported the annual audits of the Treasury Department's consolidated financial statements, which incorporate the balances of the gold reserves held by the Mint. The financial statement audit is performed by KPMG under contract with my office. KPMG has relied on our audits of the gold reserves when rendering its opinions on the Mint's and Treasury's financial statements. They have assured themselves as to the independence, reputation, and qualifications of my audit staff. In addition, they have satisfied themselves with the adequacy of the audit procedures performed. The audit work performed by both my office and KPMG is done in accordance with government auditing standards established by the GAO. Since 1993, when we assumed responsibility for the audit, my office has continued to directly observe the inventory and test the gold. In fact, my auditors signed the official joint seals, such as the one I showed you, placed on those compartments inventoried and tested in their presence. At the end of fiscal year 2008, all 42 compartments had been audited by either the GAO, the Committee for Continuing Audit of U.S. Government-Owned Gold, or my office, and placed under official joint seals. There has not been any movement of inventory gold since that time. Furthermore, in addition to observing the inventory of the gold for all of the audit periods, we selected and tested a statistically valid random sample of gold bars using a 95% confidence level. We found without fail that any differences between the fineness reported by the Mint and the fineness based on our independently obtained assay reports were immaterial and negligible. For example, during our fiscal year 2008 audit, we sampled gold valued at $75 million. Based on the independent assay of those samples, we project the dollar value of the difference based on the assay report and the Mint's inventory records to be $3,820, or five one-thousandths of one percent of the gold inventory. As discussed earlier, by the end of fiscal year 2008, all of the gold reserves in the Mint's custody have been 100% inventoried and audited. In closing, based on the work performed by my office and by my own personal observations, I can assure the subcommittee, and as you said, sir, the American people, that both the quantities and the value of the U.S. government's deep storage gold reserves held and reported by the Mint are reliable and fully audited. I mention the American people because, as you said, sir, they own this gold. The reason we go through all of the procedures that I just mentioned is to give the American people the absolute confidence that the gold reserves are as represented. Fort Knox, for instance, it isn't just a huge stockpile of gold. It is also a symbol of the stability and financial soundness of their government. To create doubt about the value or the security or even the very presence of the gold reserves without reason contributes to the distrust in government that seems to be a growing trend today. It is the obligation of every inspector general to report to the Congress and to the public areas of concern that need to be fixed but I believe it is also my obligation to report to you when something is being done right.
and that is the case here today. And that concludes my statement. I thank the gentleman and we'll proceed with to Mr. Engel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Clay and other members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss H.R. 1495, the Gold Reserve Transparency Act of 2011. As of September 30, 2010, about 95 percent of the reported U.S. gold reserves were in the custody of the Mint, of which nearly all is deep storage gold. The remaining U.S. gold reserves were in the custody of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In 1974, in response to congressional interest and in conjunction with the Mint, GAO assisted in the planning and observed the inventory of U.S. gold reserves in the depository at Fort Knox. GAO selected and audited three of the 13 compartments at that depository. As part of this audit, GAO recommended that a cyclical inventory of the gold and mint custody be performed annually to ensure that the gold in all compartments would be inventoried over a specified period of years. Acting on this recommendation, in 1975, Treasury established the Committee for Continuing Audits of United States Government-Owned Gold. <clears throat> Treasury OIG officials estimate that about 92 percent of the U.S. gold reserves have been audited by, uh, between GAO and the Committee for Continuing Audits as of September 30, 1986. Of this percent, GAO's audit in 1974 represented about 13 percent. More recently, the U.S. gold reserves have been presented in various financial reports and have therefore been subject to various audit efforts. For example, since issuing its audit report, recover, report covering the Mint's custodial schedule for fiscal year 1993, the Treasury OIG has annually audited the deep storage gold reserves in the custody of the Mint. For each of the fiscal years under audit, the Treasury OIG has issued a clean opinion on the Mint's custodial schedules. Also, the Treasury OIG did not report any material weaknesses in internal controls over financial reporting relating to these schedules for those fiscal years. H.R. 1495 provides for the Secretary of the Treasury to conduct and complete a complete full assay inventory and audit of the U.S. gold reserves and an analysis of the sufficiency of the measures taken for the security of such reserves. And considering the provisions of H.R. 1495, it will be important to consider the cost, benefit, and timing of actions needed to implement the proposed requirements. H.R. 1495, if enacted, may result in duplication of certain past and current efforts. Nevertheless, GAO would be capable of reviewing the results of Treasury's actions as called for in the bill should it be enacted. GAO's review would include visits to the facilities where the gold reserves are held to selectively observe the inventorying and the auditing of the gold. We would also examine various documentation supporting the required assay, inventory, and audit. H.R. 1495 also provides for GAO to transmit to the Congress, not later than nine months after enactment of the Act, a report of GAO's findings from such review and the results of Treasury's efforts. According to Treasury officials, because of the enormous quantity of gold that would need to be inventoried and assayed, it is unclear whether Treasury can complete such actions within the six-month period provided for in H.R. 1495. If Treasury's efforts are not completed within this period, there would be limitations on the scope of GAO's work if GAO were still be required to report out within the nine-month period. GAO stands ready to work with the subcommittee on developing changes to the provisions of H.R. 1495 that would most efficiently utilize the results of past and current gold reserve assay, inventory, and audit efforts. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Clay, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. I, I thank the gentleman. I'll start off with yielding five minutes to myself for uh, questions. I want to uh, ask both of you this question. It has to do with uh, what's happening in New York because that's been a little more difficult to understand. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding who has responsibility of the gold reserves held at the New York Fed. You did mention it in your testimony, but conversations with the Mint and the Office of the Inspector General, the Maine Treasury and New York Fed have all resulted in one or other of these entities saying to check with the other. 
but we never got a full answer. The OIG has stated that it does, not, does receive financial statements from the U, New York Fed attesting to the gold held in storage there for purposes of their financial statement audits. However, there seems to be no definite answer as to who has the responsibility for the New York Fed gold, and no one seems to know the last time it was assayed or inventoried. A common rejoinder has been, it's just a small part uh, of the gold reserves, it's only 5%. But, you know, when you look at uh, the total amount of gold we have, 5% is pretty significant uh, because it's more than 13 million ounces of gold and at $1,500 an ounce, we're talking about $20 billion that seems to be floating around out there and we just really can't pin it down. And I know we are used to talking in trillions, but this just seems uh, like poor governance. Could e either of you uh, comment on the New York Fed held gold, whether it has been assayed or inventoried, and whether it deserves to be thoroughly examined as the legislation calls for? Um, my understanding is that uh, the gold reserves in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York have not been assayed. Uh, that's just based upon my reading of reports, not from work that GAO has done. But it's also my understanding from reading a Treasury OIG report from back in 1987 that the pretty much 99.9 percent .9 of the gold reserves that uh, were in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York at that time, and I think the, the amounts of fine troy ounces when I looked has not really changed to what it is now, um, had been being audited over periods of time by the Federal Reserve uh, examiners, and that those uh, inventories had been observed by members of the uh, committee for the continuing audits that we spoke of earlier. Now, they, they, because it had not been assayed, and because it's not under the control of that committee, they have not considered that as audited. But there has apparently been inventories of it, there's been observations of that inventory, now, the last report that I saw that said that again was from back in 1986, so I don't know what's been done since then. Thank you. Mr. Thorson. Um, you're correct. We don't audit that. It is done by a third-party uh, confirmation, which is an accepted practice under audit, but uh, it, is, uh, it, it is the Treasury's gold. It's 5 percent of it uh, is there, and it's really, uh, at this point, it's immaterial to the statement in the total numbers. It's, it's immaterial? And as an auditing term, I mean, it, it, it is not included in, in what we uh, listed in the statements. But it's a relevant amount of gold, yeah. obviously. Right. Um, since this is held at the New York Fed, and the New York Fed is obviously very much involved in international arrangements uh, during the financial crisis, uh, essentially every single transaction to the tune of trillions of dollars that they transacted uh, involved foreign central banks. And over the last decade or two, central banks have been very much involved in, uh, in gold swaps and loaning gold and, and selling gold. And to date, of course, we have no evidence uh, that uh, you know, our government's ever been involved. But it seems to me like if there was ever one place where they might have gotten involved since the New York Fed is involved in international transactions, would, you, you probably don't have the answer on whether or not they did or did not. But could it be conceivable that they could have done it without your knowledge? I don't believe so, no. And uh, as far as the, any encumbrances other than the gold certificates that are held by uh, the Fed, um, we did ask that question before coming here. And what I was told was as far as encumbrances, and this was a quote, not one troy ounce is encumbered. Okay. Um, I yield back, and now I yield five minutes to Mr. Clay. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting the hearing, and let me thank the, both witnesses for your, for your testimony today. Um, according to the U.S. Mint, which is the co custodian of nearly 95 percent of America's gold reserves, the time required to move, weigh, assay, and restore the bars of gold averages six minutes per bar with a team of 19 people. Uh, the Mint points out that extrapolating that to 700,000 bars, as, as the uh, legislation requires, 
would require nearly 1.3 million man hours of incremental labor. Uh, therefore, to complete the inventory of just the gold bullion bars within six months, as this proposal specifies, would require approximately uh, 1,280 individuals. Uh, and we know that since this is a domestic issue, uh, that, uh, Mr. Chairman, your leadership would require an offset, so we would have to find the money to do this since this is a domestic issue and we have to pay for all of those things. Um, would either of the witnesses view this bill as a prudent use of taxpayer funds? And start with you, Mr. Thorson. Uh, the numbers that you quote um, are probably, just on my unscientific judgment, having been there, are probably pretty accurate. It is a remarkably small area. Um, it's uh, really surprisingly so when you're actually standing there with the compartments. Um, you're going to be able to use very few people in that, in that area, which means the I mean, the, I think you gave a figure of about 1,200 people. That's almost laughable when you actually see the space. Um, so that means it's going to take a great deal longer than, than what you would normally think. And, and if you could put 1,200 people together, have them move the bars, uh, it's going to take a very long time. I, obviously, as I said in my statement, I don't see the benefit um, at any cost, really. It's what we do. It's what we do every year. Um, I, as I said, it, it, is, you, it almost loses its effect to stand there and actually see it all because it, there is so much of it. It is there. Thank you for that response. Mr. Engel, uh, is this a good use of taxpayers' money if this bill becomes law? Well, I think, as, as I said in our testimony, that um, we would be willing to work with the subcommittee on possibly building off of the uh, assays, the inventories and audits that have already been done to address if there are concerns that there may be, um, you know, uh, things within these vaults that are no longer there. Uh, I agree that there's, they've been through an audit process. Uh, auditors have checked these seals. But if, you know, if the subcommittee wanted to have something done there, I would think we'd be talking more on a versus a full uh, assay and things that maybe some sort of sampling if you wanted to just get a feel that nothing has happened over the years since those vaults were sealed. Um, but outside of that, it seems quite a bit redundant in what's, what's already been done. All right. I, I thank both witnesses for their responses. And, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, you have five minutes to Mr. Jones from North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And, <clears throat> Mr. Engel, it's nice to see you. I have a, um, had a very pleasant uh, business relationship with Mr. Thorson on a number of issues and I thank you for always being there to be helpful and I think the reason that I wanted to be here to listen to the witnesses and, and certainly my colleagues and both sides is that as a member of Congress one of my biggest concerns is not so much the goal whether it's there or not there but is the American distrust of all of us in Congress quite frankly and I was reading, my staff got for me this, and, uh, I'll read it, it has nothing to do with this hearing, but it will lead to something in a moment. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York is refusing to tell U.S. government investigators how much money is sent to Iraq during the first years of the American invasion. As a top Iraqi official suggested, the missing and possibly stolen funds from that era is more than $18 billion. And there's Stuart Boyne, a, a wonderful inspector general that's uh, always exposed all the lost American money, going to the New York Fed, and they won't meet with him. And I think that's the reason that maybe this bill has been introduced, and, and maybe not for other reasons as well. But if the American people could just regain a little bit of confidence in Washington, whether it be an agency or the Congress itself, it would really, I think, help the environment of America. And I was wondering, I was thinking when Mr. Clay was suggesting and Mr. 
Paul, the chairman, uh, kind of uh, agreed. Does it make any sense for there to be a congressional delegation of five people, three people, six people, that every so often when you do the audit, I think you said once a year, or I might have missed that in the testimony, you have to correct me, but is it already in the guidelines or the stature that there would be a couple of representatives from the Senate and House that would be able to accompany the inspectors when they go to, or the auditors, not inspectors, auditors. Um, th to me, this is about, there's so much, if, if I could change one thing in America, and, uh, or I, if I can control one thing, be the internet. There's more misinformation on the internet than there is accurate information. And all there has to do is some person who's challenged, I'm gonna be care careful about this, that puts on the internet that you cannot find the goal at Fort Knox. Then all of a sudden, thousands of million people, millions of people are seeing that. They're not hearing what you're saying. So I just wonder if it makes any sense, if it's in your regulations or if it needs to be in the stature that there would be a, a team of two senators or two representatives that would have the option of accompanying your inspectors to one of the sites. Actually, that, uh, that has happened under a situation very similar to this one in 1974. Uh, in September of 1974, Mr., uh, I believe it was Russolo, uh, Congressman, uh, took a uh, delegation to include, I believe there's one senator, and uh, Huddleston. And they went down, and with, I assume, permission probably would have come from either Secretary of the Treasury or the White House, and, and did tour the goal. And there were pictures taken, and, and there, are, uh, there are video clips of that. And I think that's exactly what you're, you're describing. And, and it was done in 1974. Um, obviously, I don't think either one of us have any uh, authority to say anything about such a visit, but it's certainly something that the, the committee can make a request of because there is a precedent for having, it, uh, having done it. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, and I'll close in just one second. But I think in the world we live in today that there's so distrust that it would be I think for at least in, during this deep recession, recession that we're in, that if that could be accomplished, uh, that it would help, I think, with the public's trust. Uh, not so much that they should leave members of Congress, but I think that uh, if this was an announced group meeting and members, and, and then it gets some publicity and maybe there could be a news conference afterwards. I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think there's validity in, the, in, in why we're having this hearing today, and I just wanted to share those uh, thoughts with uh, the panel and you, Mr. Chairman, and my colleagues. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> in your testimony, I didn't hear any, any comments uh, about uh, the, the gold that we use to mint coins. Is that held separately, or is that not included in this, this report, or am I missing something? The, uh, is, okay, is the federal it is, uh, coin is all, it is all permitted, but it is imported on the Treasury financial and, and with the gold that we're talking about today. We have basically two types of gold. We're not gold, okay. and yes, there is that. I can ask here if I want to say it was a fine three ounces. One half of the total is working stock gold, and that's the kind that's used for mining coins, um, medallions, things like that. Okay, so that is that audited as well? I assume. Is yes, that's audited that, as part of that's part of the mints financial statements. It's okay. not part of the custodial, uh, <laughs> but it's part of the mints financial statements. Right. Okay, so how do, you, how do you replenish that stock then? Um, Are you just using existing stock or do you get new gold shipments in that you use up or how do you, how do you continue to be able to mint new gold coins? I'm, I'm, I'm not involved with it, but my understanding is that they replenish that by purchasing uh, stock, you know, purchasing outside. Just on the open market somewhere? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, it was kind of interesting. I, I, I was listening to the discussion here of my colleagues with regards to the congressional review of, of the actual gold, and I think it might not be a good it might be a good idea to do that from the standpoint of also looking at the protection and procedures, the all of the stuff that goes into it from the standpoint of of again uh, some reassurance that uh, there's adequate 
procedures in place uh, for protection of it. So it's kind of interesting to, uh, to listen to that debate. Along the same lines with regards to the uh, amount of, of gold that we have, uh, according to testimony and in, in the documents that I've been reading here, we're carrying it on our books at $41, $42.22, I believe. Is that, what, is that correct? That's the statutory value that it okay. takes to value it. Um, and you valued it a while ago at about $320 billion, is that right? At market, at market. At the current way. value today. That was September uh, 30 of last year. <coughs> and uh, yesterday, uh, we pulled it up, uh, it would be $1,552 uh, uh, an ounce and uh, 300 and uh, roughly, let's see, we don't have the... R roughly 340 billion. Okay, Mr. Chairman, a while ago, asked the question with regards to uh, using and swapping it out with regards to other other things. It, it is not used as collateral for anything either right now, is it? Other than the gold certificates, there is no use. I'm not of aware it of anything. In, other, in, in any other in way, Treasury other financial statements. There's nothing, or in the department wide, <coughs> uh, there's nothing disclosed about. So it's just sitting there right now, right? Yes. It's, okay. a, yeah. it's a reserve. It's right. a reserve. Okay. Right. It is, and and uh, uh, I'd, I'd back up his statement as far as we're not aware of anything. That I okay. What what would happen? There's some discussion about going back to the gold standard. I don't know if we ever will. It's a, it's a good idea, bad idea. But if we would, what what how would that change your operation? I, I can't speak to that the gold standard and how it would change it. on the on the gold standard issue. Yeah. If we went back to the gold standard, how would it change the operation of I, of I'm what you sure do, I, would, would we have to uh, ha have some more, would it be some transactions going on with regards to how you take care of it? Uh, would it be that uh, would we have to raise and lower the amounts that we have all the I, time or things like that? Or how, how, would we do, how would we do that? I'd have to tell you, as far as any discussion regarding returning to the gold standard, that's what you're really getting into much more a policy issue. Are, we're, we're all, both of us, we're auditors. We will, okay. um, we will certainly be able to look at any process or procedure or plan if, if that ever happened. But as far as uh, commenting on, and on that as a uh, policy as to whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, that's really out of, uh, out of our realm. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. I thank the gentleman, and we will go on and have a second round of questions if you uh, care to. Uh, it, it seems that a portion of the Mint and the U.S. Gold Reserves were audited and assayed between 93 and 2008, as, as you acknowledge. The Mint estimated that as much as one-third of the gold reserves were examined during this period. The other two-thirds, however, have not been inventoried, according to my understanding, or assayed since somewhere between 75 and 86. Do you think it would be worthwhile at least to inventory and assay this portion of the mint uh, held gold? By, uh, I, I forget which date it was, I believe by 1986, we, uh, um, hold just one second here, I got it. Uh, it, it basically covered, and by 1986, 97 percent of the government-owned gold held by the Mint had been audited and placed under joint seal. So once, once you've done that um, and that seal remains unbroken, then I'm not, I'm not sure what other benefit there would be to uh, uh, going back into it at that point. But by 86, you had 97 percent was, was audited. Yeah. Well, it, it, it just seems like it's quite a bit different the way you describe audits compared to, I think, a general understanding of audits. They don't audit uh, small portions over 20 and 30 years. And an, an audit, I thought, was supposed to be audited as quickly as possible. To well, I think this is a little different because what you've got, as opposed, for instance, if I'm, if I'm auditing uh, inventory of a company, a product goes out, product comes in, it's replaced, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, there is no movement. Those doors aren't opened. There is nothing there that can happen because once those, once those doors are sealed, and, and I've given you a couple of show and tell here examples, um, it's very obvious if those seals are ever broken. And it's not like 
in a, as I mentioned, in a normal audit where product is moved out and I, I replace it and I move on. That's not what happens here. There is no movement. Those doors are not opened, and if they are and a seal is broken, uh, then those people who, who did it is replaced, the seal is put in, in place. So I guess it's hard to imagine what benefit there would be if, in fact, the seals that cover those doors are, are unbroken. Well, it just seems like it doesn't conform to my idea of what an audit is all about. But let me go on to an, another uh, question dealing with the audits. There, there's been a lot of speculation as to the condition of the gold reserves. And as I mentioned in my opening statements, it was not until legislation was introduced and a hearing scheduled uh, that information surrounding assays and inventories conducted by the Mint and the Office of the Inspector General was forthcoming. It, and your offices have been very accommodating in the process, but it seem, seems to me that all this, uh, all this information about the activities of the Mint and the IG have been engaged with respect to the gold reserves, and a result of these activities should be gathered together in, in one place um, and made readily available, like was mentioned on the Internet, maybe we could have it available to the public. That is what my bill proposes, assay and inventory the gold, evaluate whether it's encumbered in any transaction by the Treasury, have the Treasury issue a report. The GAO is in, independently verifies that report as Congress's investigative arm. Could, could, could you comment on the reporting element of the legislation as well as the GAO's independent review? Could you also comment on the extent to which the information already available could be published? Can we get the information a little easier instead of dragging it out? If, if for no other reason for reassurance, because the, rea the questions have been building over the years, and, and when you say, well, when was it fully audited? Uh, my understanding, a full audit of the uh, gold, most people give me the date of 1953. So what about the facilitating of information to give the American people the absolute reassurance that they're asking for? Well, I guess it would depend on, on what, you, uh, what you want. We publish all of the audit reports on, on our website. They're public. Um, you all asked for assay reports, which we certainly provided. We keep them for a while. Uh, there's really no secret about it. There was one thing, uh, I guess, on the press release for this hearing that kind of uh, got my attention when you said we were less than forthcoming, I believe, was the term. I don't understand that, sir, to be honest with you. Uh, we don't publish our work papers on the Internet. I don't think any auditor does that. But uh, for the period which we have them, uh, we keep them in the normal course of events. But this is an example of a public audit report on the gold. But, it's but, out there. And uh, the assay reports, I believe your staff asked for, we provided them. Uh, the work papers, like I said, we don't normally do that, but I don't think any auditor in America does that. So whatever it is that we can do reasonably and under the proper, you know, uh, rules of, of auditing, we're happy to do because I agree. Transparency is our business. Right. I mean, that's why, why we do what we do. And if we, there are we suggestions, were, we're happy to listen to them. Uh, what we were looking for was to, uh, we thought we'd see a list of the bars or the assay details. I mean, uh, there were gross numbers, but not uh, a list of the bars and the precise assay results. Uh, clearly, the results of them are published. I mean, I think in, in my statement, which is there's nothing hidden or, uh, at all in this statement, I mentioned the range of, of uh, from the assay reports. I think it was point, uh, 6 to point nine nine nine, something like that. I mean, those, that's what the assay tells you. And then we gave you an average. So those numbers are out there. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why there's some confusion about that. Well, I think it was incomplete and in that there weren't total numbers. I think we had a much smaller number and, and a single report. Anyway, we might be able to work that out or figure it out, but it's still, you know, some confusion there. Uh, my five minutes is up, and I yield uh, to Mr. Lukenmauer uh, for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to have a couple follow-up questions. Um, what is the annual cost to store and protect our U.S. holdings? Do you have an idea? The which, I'm sorry? The annual cost to protect and hold these holdings? Uh, what it would cost to, to uh, follow through on this bill? No. Or the uh, right, now, what, right now, we have, we have the goal setting in Fort Knox and Denver. and We don't really, I mean, because 
we do audit we're doing many audits at the same time and that sort of thing I don't think we've really ever broken down what it costs to do this particular at least what it costs my office to do this um, okay, we generally I'm, I'm asking what what it costs what is the cost to I guess the government or the mint or whoever pays the bill to protect the gold Oh, the, the security. The oh, security. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I think that that would probably be something that the uh, mint would be able to to tell you what that what that costs. Uh, neither of us, I think, would know that, but okay. they would probably know what what it costs for them <clears throat> to maintain the, you know, the uh, the facilities and the the uh, depositories and things. That's not in your not in your report. I mean, you don't go back and check the it, cost for the procedures and. Of maintaining the, the we, security? We, we're auditing the inventory of the gold, not the, not the, I mean, that would be a separate job, and it's something if, if uh, your committee or somebody asked us to do, we could certainly uh, look okay. at that. But All right. as you can see, that's, a, that's really a different issue than, than uh, how much gold is present at the locations. Well, I would think protecting the gold would be pretty important to be able to count the gold. I mean, if you don't have it protected, you can't count what's not there if somebody takes it from you. I, I, I will tell you, having gone something. there, I have, I have never, and I'm former Air Force and been involved with everything from nuclear weapons, I've never seen security like I saw in that. Well, facility. that's great. I'm wonderful in that. But my question is, was it cost us? That's my question. Okay, move on. Um, the IMF has the fourth largest gold reserves in the world, and my understanding is that the members who belong to the IMF have contributed gold to it. And I guess my question is, uh, does, the, does the gold that we contribute, is, is it, is it, does IMF hold it, or do we maintain it here and just pledge it to the IMF? Or do you know? Stay the last part, please, sir. Okay. All of the members, all the people who are members of the IMF have contributed gold to their reserve. The United States is a member of the IMF. Right. Did we, when we pledged this gold, did we take it and physically move it to the IMF? Or did we just have it pledged? There, there are no, I, I'm sorry, I understand when you said, uh, there are no encumbrances on the, there's nothing, there's no reason to move it. Um, we have been assured there as, as I okay, so I quoted, there is not one troy ounce that is encumbered. Therefore, okay, so we've moved the gold to the IMF. The gold, the, the encumbrances of, that I'm aware of, the only ones are to uh, gold certificates held by the Fed. And if they were to, uh, to, to go to the physical uh, side of it, what you're talking about is if they were to redeem those gold certificates, they'd be paid in currency. They wouldn't be paid in gold. The gold is collateral. Okay. It, isn't, it wouldn't be redeemed that way. Okay, according to my resources here, that said there's 261 million ounces that's reported as U.S. Treasury owned gold. It's part of the IMF reserve. And so we don't hold it ourselves. The IMF holds it in their reserve, wherever that's at. Do we count it as ours? Not that or I know of. No. We don't count it as ours then. We count it as IMF, the IMF counts it as theirs, and we don't it's just serve an account. It's kind of like having a savings account with another bank. Do you know? No. So it's not our goal then anymore? Is it IMF's? Or is it, part of, is it ours as well? There is, uh, I, I'm, I think what, what you're talking about is the three purposes that gold can be used for, and, and the third one is what you're discussing, of which okay, we're not aware of any use in that uh, category at all. Which is, it, I believe it says, the third one is consistent with obligations of the government and IMF on orderly exchange agreements and a stable system of exchange rates, et cetera, uh, made the pres with the approval of the president, they may deal in gold. We are not aware of any case of where that is occurring. You're saying we've never done this? Is what? You're saying that we've never done this? I'm not. I, we've never I, transferred? I, I'm not aware of any time we've done that, and uh, at least uh, certainly not that it affects the uh, amount or the type of gold in the reserves, no. I think you were talking about physically moving them back and forth. That has not happened that, that in recent history. I mean, uh, going back all the way to uh, at least we cover the 70s and more. So no, I don't believe it has. Okay, well, perhaps after, off, after this, the, the, the hearing today, we can get together and find out the answer to the question, because I'm kind of concerned now 
that we don't know we've lost 261 million ounces. Either we gave it to and have now an account with the IMF. We, we know we still no have it in our possession. Movement. Do we, or we still have it in our possession, and we're not, we don't know where it's at, and it is encumbered, one yeah. or the other. There, there has, I, I can say there has been no physical removal of any of the gold during that time. If there is, I think what you're, you're asking is, is there any uh, uh, obligation or something that would, it would cause that? In other words, who owns that gold is really what you're, you're saying. And uh, to our understanding, that has not occurred. And we can, we can certainly get you a more definitive answer. Okay. And, and well, my information could right be people. correct, but I've, it's information that uh, I would think would be, would be correct. So it tells me that we would like a little more research to do here. Thank it, you very much. I guess my answer to be real clear was that we do not believe that has occurred. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to follow up on that because uh, you may have given the answer, but I still don't think it's very clear. <laughs> Is it possible that the gold is counted twice, once in the IMF and also on our balance sheet of the 261? Is, is, the, is the gold at the IMF part of the 261 ounces that we claim that we own? I, I don't think it's possible that it could be counted. You say you don't. counted twice if it, as it that would affect the statement? Is that, is that what you're asking? Well, we have pledged gold. We have pledged gold to the IMF. Every country has to put so much gold in the IMF. So is it sitting over here in the IMF and, uh, and we no longer own it, right? I, I, I mean, we do not audit, obviously, we do not audit the IMF, so I can't make yeah, any Yeah, but we're trying to that. figure out uh, the accounting procedures on whether when you go and audit the gold, maybe you don't know that you audit and check in gold and look at these bars, but they really have been pledged to the IMF. Is, is that a possibility? No. Not I, I don't believe, uh, uh, no. Well, I'm not going to comment on IMF or what they're doing because we don't audit the IMF. Mm -hmm. Um, but the statements that I've made regarding the gold reserves of the Mint, our Mint, our Treasury Department Mint, that's pretty absolute. And, and we know where it is, we know how much it is, and we know that it is there. And none of it has been removed to, uh, and nor do we believe there are any encumbrances against it other than what I mentioned by gold certificates of the Fed. Now, we have the certificates, the Fed holds certificates, they're gold, called gold certificates. The Treasury holds the material gold. Right. Does, the, does, um, does Treasury, what if a law was passed and we instructed Treasury to sell, you know, $20 billion worth of gold? Right. Can we do that? Or is there, uh, do we have to get permission from the, maybe the encumbrance is to the, to the Federal Reserve, maybe they're in charge and not Treasury. Can, can, what can we do with that gold and who really owns it? I think you, you're trying to back into the same question there, which I think if you wanted to, uh, to do that, that would be a question that would go to the Secretary of the Treasury with consultation, I'm sure, by the President who could do that. I don't think they're going to have to get permission from the IMF to do that because there is no encumbrance on that gold other than the gold certificates held by the Fed. Well, but that, and is, if they that redeemed, is an encumbrance. If they that would change those, the balance sheet of the Fed because they count that. So if, I don't know whether that would, you know, uh, the Fed is pretty secret, you know, and Congress doesn't have much to say about what's going on over there. And they, they do a lot of hiding. Uh, so I'm not so sure it would be, uh, the answer could be that well, simple. And that's, I understand you're asking the question. I, I, I've tried my best to reassure you that that isn't the case. But on the other hand, remember, if somebody did try and redeem those gold certificates, let's say they were pledged to somebody and they brought them forward and they wanted to redeem them, they would be paid in currency at the statutory rate. Not They would not be uh, paid in gold. The gold is collateral. It is not the, the method of, of payment. Uh, so they would receive whatever the value is of those certificates. The gold would remain in the custody of the United States and uh, would no longer be uh, collateral for those certificates that were redeemed. But I, I could maybe add something on that. The, as it relates to the gold certificates, the gold certificates do not represent that the Federal Reserve has ownership on that gold. There's a liability that's actually recorded in the financial statements for about $11 billion that represents the gold, what we owe the Federal Reserve for those gold certificates. Now, if we were to go to sell 
some of that gold, my understanding is that uh, Treasury would have to retire those gold certificates, and then I think it's what Mr. Thorson's saying, we would, there would be a reduction in the cash balance that, the, uh, federal, that uh, Treasury has over at the Federal Reserve for the amount of whatever at that $42.22 per, you know, whatever amount of the gold certificates you were redeeming. But there is, there is an actual liability that's recorded currently and has been for years on the government's financial right. statements for the amount that they owe the Federal Reserve for those gold certificates. They owe, yeah. owe the Federal Reserve. And, and that's what I meant by the fact that it would, if they were redeemed, obviously, because it is a liability, if they presented those, there is an obligation to, mm -hmm. uh, to pay those. But it would not be paid in gold bars. I want to go back to uh, asking for suggesting that we have more thorough reports in our request from, from you on these reports. We did get uh, one assay report was given as an example. There were 86 bars involved and you showed the details on what you found. But of course, there's a lot more. Why, why can't we get this a list of each compartment, how many bars, what percentage, whether it's 0.999 or 0.90, and have the entire uh, gold uh, reserves that we have audited in that manner, so we see this one report, but we're asking, uh, since there's a claim that all this has been audited and checked, could not that be all into one report, since we only got one assay report? The, the, I think what you're describing is really what the Mint does as far as, remember, the, the Mint inventories and assays, we audit, and, and there's a difference there. Um, what you're asking for, I believe, really, uh, you need to direct that uh, to the Mint, and they can uh, probably satisfy you as to what kind of records you're really looking for there. The Mint should have, the Mint should have um, records by bar, uh, what the fineness is of each of those bars. I would think they would have records as to what's been assayed of those bars as, as part of the inventorying and audit process, but I think they're the ones that would have that, that type of detail. Right. Okay. Um, I see Mr. Schweikert has come in. Are you ready to uh, pursue and ask a question at this time? Or? Pass. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Well, uh, I'll go back to Mr. Lukenmauer if he has follows up. I just have one, one follow up here with regards to the last question or line of questioning we were at. The more I think about it, the more concerned I am because we need to know if the goal that the U.S. has contributed to the IMF. We need to know if it is still counted as a U.S. gold reserve. In other words, if it is, then it is an encumbered amount of gold that we have sitting there and should be reported as such. If it's not, it should be reported like a savings account for an individual on their financial statement and should be reported then on, our, on our, the financial statement of our government as an asset setting in the IMF. Well, I, I think what you're saying, clearly, if, if it was encumbered or belonged to IMF or anyone else, um, that would need to be reflected on the statement because we are representing this is the Treasury's goal, and therefore that would not be an accurate statement if it were encumbered. We have been assured that none of that is encumbered, and therefore that is the total amount. Um, uh, and, and so I... I I guess there are a number of theories that you could put well, forth as to how well, that as, would be. Well, as auditors of our, of our gold, you should know whether that gold, if it's sitting in the IMF, is reported on our balance sheet somewhere for the government. Well, and gold we, held we, by the IMF, is, 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 it would not be... Uh, that, that, that we, like I said, we don't audit IMF, so I'm not going to try and uh, yeah, but aren't you auditing guess the gold? On what's going on there. But if it were, if what we do represent is the Treasury's gold, the U.S. gold reserves, which we know where they are, and they're not held by they're not held by IMF or well, who owns, controlled who owns, by IMF. Who owns what's in the IMF then? Who does? Yeah, who owns the gold? That's the United States government's gold. Who owns that then? If it's sitting in the IMF, do we not own that? If uh, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I give you an accurate answer, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer until I can get you a, the proper answer and w that is absolutely accurate, because uh, I, I can't give you an answer on that off the top of my head. Okay, well, if we go on seven, we're supposed to have 17 percent of, of the IMF, and if we own 17 percent of the 90 million ounces, that's a whole lot of money, and we need to know where it's at. Right. So I would certainly appreciate your willingness to work with us to find out 
number one, um, is it counted among our reserves and we're not aware of it right. and therefore not, not there? And if it's not, where does it appear on our balance sheet as, a, as an asset to the United States government? No, you, you ask a good question, and that's mm -hmm. why I said I don't want to give you an okay. answer off the top of my head. I want a real answer. Well, I want to work with and, you to find out make sure where it's at here. And I will get you one. Appreciate it. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Welcome, I, and I, uh, thank you for this hearing, uh, Chairman. And I, I would like to ask both of the um, witnesses uh, whether you believe this is a good use of your resources and funds, uh, especially if it's true, as you testified, that it is duplicative of what you already have to do with respect to gold reserves. And I'm, I'm mentioning basically uh, Bill 1495, and in, in this, uh, the GAO wrote, and I quote, Bill 1495, if enacted, may result in duplication of certain past and current efforts, especially, especially with regard to inventorying and auditing the gold reserves of the United States, end quote. And the Treasury's IG wrote, and I quote, I believe that the inventory and audit requirements proposed in the Gold Reserve Transparency Act of 2011, H.R. 1495, to be redundant of the work that my office and the Mint have currently performed, end quote. And basically, why should Congress pass legislation that both the IG and the GAO believe is not needed? That's my question. Good to see you both. Go ahead. Mr. Thorson, would you begin first, and then Mr. Angle? In our statement, we did say we believe it redundant because the things that are called for in the Act are things we believe we are already doing. Uh, and that is a proper audit, an assay. We do assay to a, uh, a statistical sampling. Uh, we don't assay every bar of gold, but we do it to a 95 percent uh, confidence level. So I'm not sure what it is that you would want us to do that we aren't really already doing. Okay. Mr. Angle? Um, the one area that we, we talked about a little bit earlier that uh, that maybe if you wanted to have something looked at is the uh, gold reserves that are over the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Now, there has been some audit work that was done years ago uh, by the examiners of the, the Federal Reserve, and apparently the uh, Committee for Continuing Audits had observed some of that. But uh, that's not been labeled as audited, per se, as I understood it by the Committee for uh, uh, Continuing Audits. So if, if you did want to have something done, I guess you could have some work done over on the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, in terms of some of the other, it would be very uh, redundant of what's been already done. Can, can each of you comment on what you believe would be the cost to taxpayers of implementing H.R. 1495, since we are being very cautious about our deficit at this point in I, I think both of us would agree. I think the Mint has worked up some numbers uh, that are somewhere above $60 million or more um, that would be in that range, but I think that's a question more directly. Uh, they should probably direct to the Mint. Mr. Thor Angle, do you have a comment? No, we, we, we do not. No, we haven't heard from the Mint what the amounts are. Uh, it's our understanding they were working up what they would estimate it would cost. I think they were also because in addition to the cost of actually doing the inventorying and moving all the bars, when you assay it, uh, you're taking a drill, you're taking a part of the bar to be tested, and that's basically destroyed, whatever that piece is. So there will be some loss of the gold from the bars through the assaying process if you do that for every single bar that's out there. So there would be a loss from that process as well. Well, I have no further questions, so I yield back to the chairman. Thank you. I'd like to address the subject of the uh, cost uh, because our first estimate. Hmm? Oh, okay. I um, will yield five minutes to Mr. Schweiger from Arizona. Um, You're kind, Mr. Chairman. And forgive me if this has already been discussed. Um, uh, curious, ed ed educate a freshman. Um, the different places that U.S. gold um, assets are held, um, IMF, um, you were just saying, was the New York Fed, the Treasury, any other places? Not that I can see. No. So, so those three would cover it? 
Um, any of that pledge to loan facilities that would be World Bank or anything else we, we also touch? No, and the, uh, to go back to the IMF for a little bit, like I said, I'm, I w would like to find a direct answer for that one as well. Okay, and, and my understanding if from listening a moment ago, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, was that it's been how long since, um, was, it the, was it the New York Fed? Um, which actually would handle a lot of international transactions, so therefore they would not only hold our, some gold reserves for the U.S., but um, a no number of other member nations? As I understand it, I believe they do hold gold for other nations in their, yeah. in their vault. Um, do, just for the fun of it, any guess um, what's there? I don't know. Any guess on the number of um, participating countries? No. Okay. That would be something the Federal Reserve would obviously be able to answer, but I don't know. That. Okay. So if, if we have functionally three places, two that you're telling me we already have some audit history, um, you know, tre Treasury, um, you know, we have audit history on gold supply. Yes? No? The gold reserves. Yeah. yeah. And um, we're still a little fuzzy, was it, on IMF? I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm still a little concerned about that particular question. Okay. So, but no, I mean, this, that's it. And, uh, but uh, in a previous question just a moment ago, didn't we just tell the good um, lady from New York that, or gentlewoman from New York, I'm still working on these terms, um, it was how much to do the audit? To, to do the audit? Um, uh, the men's figure, the men's figure to do the, the one that this bill would call for, it was in the neighborhood of 60 million. But I, uh, that was, uh, you need to. That is a mint number, and you need to ask them that. Um, and uh, and just to, to be clear, the the ratio of money uh, held by mint and held by Fed is 95 and 5 percent. 5 percent is at the Fed. So just for whatever. Uh, but as far as the cost of this bill to uh, to perform that, I think. Uh, I, I believe your staff's already made an inquiry to the men of that, but that's really, we, we can certainly, you know, audit that as it, as it plays out and that kind of thing, but it's, it's their number. Okay. It, it just, it seems stunningly high, and it's always fun when you're having to audit the audits. Um, you know, we're, we're, we feel like we're in some of this very unusual circle. It'd be fun to find out how much of that is just counting and how much of it is doing assay work. So. And Mr. Chairman, I know you wanted to inquire more on that point, so I yield back my time. I, I thank the gentleman. I do have a few more short questions for you. Uh, do you have any idea what uh, the current audits cost? You do partial uh, audits each, each year. Uh, what kind of expenses is that involved? No, as I mentioned, we, we use people on different audits at the same time and that kind of thing, so we've not really broken down per audit. Uh, what this costs. Okay. Where, where do you get the 60 million? Um, it was a, we, we asked the same questions that you did as far as uh, what would it be from the Mint when we, we were wondering what their statement might be and uh, uh, that, was a, that was a rough number that we were told that uh, off the top of their head it would be in somewhere in that vicinity. Of course we had one Treasury uh, statement that claimed that it would be uh, 15 million dollars so we'd like to, if you can uh, enlighten us more maybe in writing about really whether it's 60 million or 15 that's a that's a big difference um, and to suggest that uh, I might be participating in uh, not being careful with the taxpayers money I happen to be the most uh, conservative uh, member of Congress on when it comes to spending but you, you know we don't even need to appropriate money for this that the the mint could easily take care of this they made 400 you know, when you have a monopoly, you tend to be able to make some money. And last year, they made $400 million. So e even if the high number were correct, we don't have a problem there. And this is one of the few legitimate functions of government is to check uh, our ownership and be fiscally responsible to find out, you know, just what we own and whether it's really there. So uh, I think the total amount is uh, uh, not, in, in comparison to other things, is not very much. Also, back to uh, this request that we get more details on the on the right. uh, on the thing, and you said deferred to the maybe I should ask the mint uh, that, and of course 
the mint is in transition now, and we couldn't get anybody over here from the mint. But um, I believe it was, it was your staff that told my staff that you got the reports and not, uh, and not the mint, that you, that you get uh, the detailed reports on all these uh, audits. The, the assay reports, we do get the assay reports, sure. And I, and I think we, uh, um, we provided you some of those. The inventory of the bars, like you described, you know, as each one, that's, that's definitely up to the Mint to, uh, uh, as they said, we audit the work that they do and the records that they keep. So that would, be, that would of course, fall under them. If you, if you have an assay, but you don't know how many bars there are, you don't know whether it applies, which applies to which, it seems like you have to have both you know, together and, and matched up. But anyway, uh, I believe we'll f follow up on that and ask for some, uh, some more details. But uh, uh, if the gentleman from Arizona has no more uh, question, I uh, will go ahead and uh, adjourn the committee.